significance isn't about waiting for the afterlife. Every day when we show kindness and goodness to others in our daily interaction, we're living out a life that has eternal value. This is a lifestyle choice that we carry with us forever and it's not about perfection. After all, such perfection is beyond human reach. Instead, it's about embracing the life Jesus has shown us, a life filled with kindness and love in What Must I Do to Live? Hallelujah. Praise the living God. Thank you for coming today, and you're welcome to church. And for those of our friends who are streaming online, we want to welcome you to the Global Outreach Church. And we thank God for you for choosing today to be a part of this service. Amen? Amen. Is everyone doing okay today? Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So we're going to read a lot of scriptures today, and we have a very small conversation, and then we will pray. Amen? Is that okay? Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're going to start with praying, and we're going to pray from the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12. And we're going to pray with our prayer this morning. And at the end of today, we're also going to pray, and we're going to pray for one another. We're going to do a very, um, some spiritual exercise, if you will. It's just going to be basically speaking and prophesying the scripture unto one another. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So let's start and begin from the book of Romans, <clears throat> Romans chapter 12. And we're just going to use that scripture to pray. In Romans chapter 12, if you can give it to me in message, translation, and we're going to read verse 1 and 2, I think. We're going to use that word to pray. It says, so here is what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, going to work, and working around life, and place it before God as an offering. That's why we want to pray this morning, and you're going to speak to God and tell God, God, my everyday, ordinary life. When I'm sleeping, it talks about family first. You sleep in your home, you sleep in your fam- with your family. When I'm sleeping, when I'm eating, that's typically a family-oriented activity. It sounds very ordinary, but God is saying, take that ordinary life. Ordinary activity, ordinary everyday activity, right? Amen. When you go to work, sounds very ordinary. We just wake up, we jump into our cars, we go to work, or you work remotely from home, and you have a lot of interaction with people, a lot of people um, you know, hurt you, step on your toes or your fingers. Um, <laughs> And life goes on. But God says, take that ordinary life, that ordinary daily activity, that very seemingly menial activity, and it talks about when you walk around on your daily life, when you travel to, on your vacation, when you go watch the games, whether Falcon is losing or winning. (laughs) Every time you walk out of your house, when you come to church this morning, God said, even though it looks ordinary, take all of these ordinary everyday work 
and give it to God Amen. as an offering. <laughs> Hallelujah. You are going to pray with that understanding this morning, and you're going to itemize your everyday life and say, Lord, only if you meant it. If you don't mean it, don't worry, but I'm praying. If you mean it, say, Lord, I am giving it all unto you as a sacrificial offering this morning. Will you bow your head and pray? Talk to God. Take, take that your ordinary day, ordinary day, daily living activities, the ordinary life, everyday lifestyle, give it to him. Say, so give it to him as an offering. Say, Lord, I am giving it unto you. When I go into my school, to learn is seemingly look ordinary. When I go to the workplace, when I go to grocery, when I go to play with my friends, when I'm watching football, whatever it is that I do on a daily basis, Lord, I am committing today that I give it all to you as a sacrifice offering. I am relinquishing it unto you. I am giving it unto you as a sacrificial offering from today forward. It is yours from today. It is yours because it is the ordinary daily life you have created me to live. It is the life you have given me to live. You wake me up every morning to do all of this activity. Now I give it back unto you. Because we know, we are persuaded that whatsoever is committed into the hands of God, he is able to keep it unto the perfect day. So therefore, Lord, this morning as a church, as a congregation of your people, as a, as the, as a congregation of believers, we agree together in unison. We give unto you every day, every ordinary life when we are sleeping, when we are eating, when we are going to work, when we are walking around life, Every place we go, everything we do, on our daily basis, Lord, we give it unto you today. Moving forward as a sacrificial offering. We relinquish it unto you, Lord, for your use yes. to bring forth praise and glory to your holy name as we have prayed with faith and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. If you believe that, say a big amen. amen. Thank you. So now let's go into the message for today. And we're going to come back to that scripture at the end of the message today. So the message today is going to be titled, What Must I Do to Live? What Must I Do to Live? And we're going to use scriptures, read two scriptures or two stories to kind of see how we can create a premise upon which we want to speak today. I'm sure we are very familiar with some scriptures where this, um, call it phrase, was used. Was, what must I do to live? What is the must do for me to live? Again, every day, every day. Every day I wake up, what must I do? So there were two stories in the scriptures, maybe in multiple fashion, but I think there were two uh, caliber of people that were talked about. And we look at those two stories, and then we will pray. But before we do that, we are also going to look at the word of our Lord Jesus Christ, um, the last prayer he prayed. And we look at that in John chapter 17. I, I found that very interesting. I love the scripture. John chapter 17. Remember I said we're going to read the Bible, so we're going to read a lot of the scriptures today. Amen? So in the book of John chapter 17, if you pay attention with me as we read again in message translation, Jesus said these things. Then, raising his eyes in prayer, this was the, his last prayer, he said, Father, it is time. Display this, the bright splendor of your son, so the son in turn may show your bright splendor. Now you're going to underline this next one. You put him in charge of everything human, so he might give real 
and eternal life to all in his care. And this is the real and eternal life, that they know you, the one and only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. I glorify you on earth. You want to underline this one as well. By completing down to the last detail what you assign me to do. Hallelujah. This is talking about eternal life, and we're going to look at the story of the rich man and the story of um, a religious leader that asked Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? What must I do to qualify for eternal life? And here in the last prayers of Jesus, before we go into that story, Jesus made it plainly clear here that God put everything concerning humanity under his care. Everything. He puts under the care of Christ, the, our Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason for that was so that Jesus might give real and eternal life to everyone that believes in him. So, and he mentioned something else that I want us to pay attention to. You need to pay critical attention to this, that eternal life, everlasting life, kingdom life, God's life is this, that you know God and Jesus Christ his son, whom he sent. How is that eternal life? I thought eternal life is when I die, I go to heaven, I have some, you know, many wives. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> in some jurisdiction, that's what eternal life means. You're going to have many wives. So um, when you see slaughtering and all the war that is going on in the Middle East, some of the purpose was the more you do that, the many, many, many reward of wives you get in heaven. What is eternal life? Some of us think that we have to do good stuff so that when we finally die, we go somewhere called paradise, and we have mansions. There's going to be a lot of mansions. That's fine, but please pay attention to what Jesus is saying. This is eternal life, that they know you as the true and only living God and Jesus Christ, your son, whom you have sent. That is eternal life. So when we look at those two stories, I want you to bear those in mind. What must I do? In order to have eternal life, you need to first understand what eternal life means before you know what to do. Amen. Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay. Do we have those pencils down? Now, let's look at the story. We want to look at the first story in John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I want to look from verse number 1. The book of John, chapter 5, verse number 1. John, chapter 5, from verse number 1. Okay? Here right, we go. Soon another feast came around, and Jesus was back in Jerusalem. Near the sheep gate in Jerusalem, there was a pool in Hebrew called Batiza, with five alcoves. Hundreds of sick people, blind, crippled, paralyzed, were in these alcoves. 
One man had been an invalid there for 38 years. When Jesus saw him stretch out by the pool and knew how long he had been there, he said, do you want to get well? Okay, pay attention to this story very well. See, we pray in the beginning by placing our everyday ordinary life as a covenant to him. That's what Jesus did. The consequences of that, we will talk about it very shortly, but that's one of, this is one of it. In the pool of Bethesda, it is a very popular pool. A lot of people come there, just like we go to many, um, many beach where we enjoy. We take cruise. We do all of these things. Ordinary life. Nothing wrong with it. And there are a lot of sick people there, a lot of invalid people. There, there was this particular one that had been there for 38 years. And the Bible said, in Jesus' ordinary cruise, ordinary life, normal day, regular day, when he was just walking by the sea, at the pool of Bethesda, for 38 years, many prophets have been there, preachers, Levites, pastors, rich people, poor people, and very, very many sick people have been at this pool for 38 years. But not a single one of them took notice of this man that was stretching at the pool. Not a single one person. Because when Jesus asked him, will you want to be made well? <laughs> Look at his answer. Look at his answer. He said, the sick man said, Sir, in verse number 7, John 5, verse number 7, the sick man said, Sir, when the water is stirred, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool for 38 years. For 38 years, I cannot quantify how many people have been at this pool for 38 years, but there was no single one to help this man. <laughs> and a lot of these thousands and millions of people that I predict might have visited this pool are candidate of eternal life. They all hope they have eternal life. Or I presume they all think they have eternal life. But 38 years, there were no single man that could help this invalid to get in the pool. Everyday life. Take your everyday life. Every activity, everything you do that is ordinary, God said, give it to me as a sacrificial offering and see what I will do with it. Jesus took notice, asked the question, and the man said, I want to, but there is no one that will help me. <laughs> Hallelujah. And Jesus said, take up your pallet and walk. And instantly, he was made whole. Every time you go on cruise, there are invalids there. Every time you go watching sports, there are invalids there. Every time you are at school, every time you are in business, every time you are at your job, there are invalids there. Can you imagine how many years they have been waiting for someone to take them into the pool? But they've not seen one. And we have millions and millions in our generations that are headed towards eternal life. Something that doesn't exist. Because in our mind, we think eternal life is somewhere else. No. Jesus had to define what eternal life is. It's right now. It's right here. Yes. Yes. It's your everyday life. It's every moment you wake up. It's every time you are in your family. It's every time you go to grocery. Eternal life 
is written in our heart. That's why we're going to pray again. You see, that ordinary life is eternal life. It's where eternal life lies. It's the reason for which Jesus came. 38 years. I couldn't believe it. But that's our life today. Amen? Amen. Are you with me so far? Now we're going to read the second story. The second story is about the question, what must I do to have eternal life? There were two categories of people that asked this question. The first one we made to understand was the man, the Bible referred to it, a rich official. Say there was a rich official. Let's look at that in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 from verse number 18. Luke chapter 18 from verse number 18. What must I do to live? To live, to live, to live, to live on my daily basis. Because in this world, there are two worlds that we live in. The worlds of the living and the worlds of the dead. The worlds of the living and the world of the dead. You see that in the scripture? That's, that was in my word. I didn't make it up. The words of the living and the words of the, of the dead. This earth that we live in, it has the living and it has the dead. Even though we are all walking around, it's like <laughs> walking cadavers, walking dead. You know, you know the definition of, uh, so I think I don't recall what I was watching it play. And the zombies, you know how the zombies, I think it was Halloween season. And they were asking the zombie, uh, zombie, who, who are you? How do you define yourself? And the zombie said, well, uh, dead, undead? Dead, undead. <laughs> so his dead is undead. So the zombie doesn't know what actually he could call himself. And so in the scripture, the scripture made us understand that there is a word that we live in, the word of the living, the word of the dead, this very earth we are in. That man at the pool of Bethsaida had not seen any man living until he saw Jesus. Okay? I've said that again. He has not seen a living until he saw Jesus. Every man that is living has life in him to give. The dead don't have life to give. For 38 years, there was no one to give life. But look at it. Every time we give life, we think it's all this gymnastic that we do. No. That man, the only thing he needed was for a man to pull him in the pool to get life. And there was no one to do it for 38 years. Are you telling me you need some anointing or oil to be poured on your head in order to pull a man from the poolside into the pool? Of course you don't. But because we are ignorant, we have no idea what eternal life means. We have no idea what we are created for. So there was no single man in 38 years to give life. To this man at the pool of Bethesda. So here we go again. This rich man is going to ask Jesus about eternal life. One day, one of the local officials asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to deserve eternal life? How can I get eternal life? Or what must I do to live? The good thing about this is, this is a man that is alive. Why is he asking for life? I don't think we pay attention to that. That question, we read it so quickly that we don't pause. He's alive. Why is he asking how to live? What to do in order to live? Or in order to have a kind of life? Because he knows he's dead. Until we understand that we are dead, we cannot ask for life. You will not be asking for life if you have life. 
Have you thought about that? He knows he's dead, even though he is rich. He needed life. And he's asking, there's something missing. I need to know. Let's look at the second. There's another one. And we're going to come back to this. Um, uh, actually, let's go to, to, Luke, to book of Luke, the, Luke, the same book of Luke chapter 10. Same question from a different angle, a different persona. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, uh, verse 25. Let's look at Luke 10, 25. Luke 10, 25, it says, Just then a religious scholar, the first one was a rich person. Well, he doesn't go to church, maybe, uh, what? no. Even though he is rich, he doesn't go to church. He recognized something is missing. He needed life. He needed to live. And he's asking Jesus, what must I do to live? And here is a religious scholar that knows the Bible, read the Bible, you know, from beginning to the end, came to Jesus to put him to a test. He said, and just then, a religious man stood up with a question to test Jesus. That's the problem with Christianity. We've been in the church. We know, you know, we've been so many, many messages. We've preached so many messages. You know, we've read the scriptures. We've listened to so many messages. And it has lost its meaning altogether. That's what this religious man represents. If you want to put Jesus to test, say, teacher, what do I need to do to enter life? Again, if he already has life, why will he be asking the question? Why? But I want us to pay attention to Jesus' answer. Basically, Jesus answered both questions. What is written in the commandment? And they both answer. Well, you know, the first one, the rich man, he just, Jesus basically said, you know, do what God says in the commandment. And he gave him the litany of commandment. And the man said, well, I've done all of this from my youth. <laughs> Teacher, I'm a perfect person when it comes to fulfilling the law. I know the law from beginning to the end. And I've taken note of it. I've taken perfection of it. I never miss one from the beginning. You see, when, when, <laughs> <hallelujah. laughs> when, we, when we look at the Christianity today, we still have this same mindset. Know it all, have it all. Some people think the grace message is, is something new. When they heard about grace, somebody talking about grace, they became mad. They're so, so annoying. <laughs> what is this jargon? <laughs> what is all this? Just the same way when Jesus came, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're looking at him funny. What is he talking about? And that's what this religious scholar represents. And, and Jesus simply said, okay, you know, um, what is the commandment? Uh, how do you read it? And he gave him all those words. Thou must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your might, and, and thou must love your neighbor. And Jesus said, yeah, well said. Go do it. <laughs> then the Bible said, one thing to prove is ignorance. The way my, my emphasis, when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, I mean, the commandment that says, love your neighbor, he said, who exactly is my neighbor? And we look at that story <laughs> as well. I don't know. <laughs> With uh, <clears throat> what is the time? I'm not sure what the time is saying. Maybe it's not set. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, based on Jesus' answer, Jesus is telling these folks you can fulfill all the laws <laughs> as much as you want. It doesn't lead to eternity. It does not give eternal life. The law is fertile to produce eternal life. Jesus came 
in order for us to understand this. God was the one that gave the law. And he did say that because the law could not achieve what he wanted to do, that's why grace had to come. Exactly. That's the reason Jesus came. Exactly. I don't know why people are still contending with that. So Jesus, in both answers, clearly shows both of them the futility of the law in attaining eternal life. Again, because they have no understanding of what eternal life is, that's why we pray with the first prayer, what actually is eternal life? And so, after answering the question, Jesus, being a very, very loving and kind person, loved this second guy. I said, okay, let's, let's, let's break it down. Let's talk about this. You want to know who your neighbor is? Come, all right, let's go ahead. Let's, let's look at that. Amen? And so, let's look at that book of Luke. The book of Luke and let's look from that, um, from verse number, I don't know where we pick it from quickly so we don't waste so much time. Uh, you, you should be able to please study this at home. Um, but let's say if we, yep, let's pick it up from verse number 30. Um, Jesus answered by telling a story. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off leaving him half dead. Next verse. Luckily, we don't know whether this is luckily or unluckily, <laughs> but the Bible says luckily. From the perspective of this man that was beaten, this man that, that had been attacked by robbers, he saw a priest, said, thank God. A priest is coming the same way. Luckily, a priest was on his way down. This is heaven bound, Holy Ghost filled. This is someone that is waving the flag of eternal life. He was going the same road. Pay attention because it said the same road. It is the same road. I've had some preachers talk about the man going down. And so that means he was on the wrong road. Oh, okay. So how about the priest? How about the Levite? Because the Bible says the same road. The same road. But when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Next verse. It gets really interesting. Then a Levite, religious man, showed up. He also avoided the injured man. Everyday life. Traveling to Hawaii. On your way to Mexico. Traveling to Australia. Las Vegas, <laughs> or should I say Paris, in France. This priest and the Levite saw the wounded man and took a detour and went on their way. Pay attention to this. What is Jericho? Why did Jesus use Jericho? A certain man traveling or going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem is a land with bread. Plenty. Everything is rosy there. But Jericho was the first city to be conquered when you enter Canaan. The promise of God. The promised land. Jericho was that city that had to be conquered in order to enter and enjoy the promises of God in Canaan. So that's why this man was headed towards Jericho. He was heading towards his destiny. 
He was heading towards the promises of God. He was going to enter into what God has in store for him. And on his way, he was attacked by robbers. What is Jericho? Why is Jesus interested in Jericho? Everyday life. Everyday activities. And here we have Satan trying to stop this man from entering into what God has in plan. And our priest, carrying the flag of eternal life, saw a man that was supposed to enter life and stopped by Satan and go the other way. We didn't see the angel do that. And we're supposed to be more than the angel. Remember when, Mike, uh, uh, when angel uh, Gabriel was fighting and then Michael has to come to the rescue? And I, I won't go into that. I think that looks a little bit confusing to us. But we'll talk about that some other times. But what is the priest supposed to do? What was the Levite supposed to do? Seeing a man that was on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho, and you are on the same path, on the same road, traveling on the same road, and this man was beaten, this man was... When we hear the word beaten, right, they took his clothes. What does that mean? Who do you think is in action here? Who is the man that takes people's garment? Who is the man that beats people? Who is the man that leave people half dead or actually the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy? God, Jesus is using this as a parable. For a man he has created, made in his own image and likeness, who was on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho to enter into Canaan with promises of God, but Satan stopped him. And the priest will not help, the Levite will not help, the church will not help. But, thank God for the Samaritan. Yes. Next verse. <laughs> thank God for the Samaritan. So the Bible said, a Samaritan traveling the road came on him. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disinfecting the band and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn, and made him comfortable. And you know the rest of the story. There was one man that has eternal life in him. He happens to be a Samaritan, not a member of the church, not a priest, not a Levite. But he has eternal life in him. He recognized a man that was destined for good. And he saw the devil is trying to stop him. Yes. See what he did? Exactly what Jesus we do. Amen. See, the Bible said he saw him. He had compassion on him. Just like the man at the pool of Bethesda. That Jesus was the only one out of all the millions that have been coming that saw him. So he saw him. Rather than take a detour, he put a pause on his journey. He was traveling. He was headed towards his home promised land. But he stopped. He recognized we are going together. I shouldn't have to go alone. I need to stop. There is no reason to be in a hurry. Why should I rush and leave you? The did God not show us that similar sample? After the children of Israel were delivered from Egypt, did he not say, you know, after you have given your own portion of land, leave it alone until your brothers have gotten their own. Eternal life in our everyday life. Everyday life. So this Samaritan has eternal life in him. And that's why he was able to give life unto a dying man. Hallelujah. 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 
What must I do to live? Let's rise on our feet. <laughs> I just came to tell the story today. To live eternal life or everlasting life, a real and meaningful life, is not something we can do independently out of God. Eternal life or everlasting life is not something we can do by fulfilling the laws. There's no amount of laws you fulfill that will grant you eternal life. If that was the case, Jesus would not come. To know what I must do to live, I must begin with knowing God through his Son, Jesus Christ. Learn from him and learn of him. Before I know what to do to live a meaningful life, eternal life, I have to start by learning Jesus so I to know who God is. That's the prayer we pray that we began with. Everything I learn about God through my relationship with Jesus Christ transforms anything I do on a daily basis to eternal life. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> everything I learn through my relationship with Jesus Christ, everything I learn about God transforms everything I do on a daily basis to living eternally, living a meaningful life that will last for eternity. That's, that's basically what eternal life is trying to say. It's life first and foremost, then it lasts for everlasting. It lasts for eternity. But what kind of life is it? It is a life that knows who God is through the Lord Jesus Christ and living that same life. And it will never happen except a man we go through the only channel God has given us, which is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So what must I do? What must I do to live? We we'll go back to Romans chapter 12. It's what we started with. What must I do to live? So here is what you need to do. God helping you. Take your every ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Acknowledge and tell God that every day, every moment, everything I do, I'm placing it in your hand as an offering. And see what God will do with it. There are a lot of scriptures that I want us to read, but I would rather have us pray. And I would rather have us pray with that prayer. If you go, if you have time when you, when you get home, just, you know, take the whole of uh, Romans chapter 12 and read through. And there are some key things that I want us to learn from there. But I think we can stop here. I'm going to read that Romans chapter 12 one more time as we close. So here is what you should do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and working around life, and place it before, that's, the, that's, that's all you need to do. Do that, do that, and what is going to happen? So, I, I, I continue reading that. Embracing what God does for you Pay attention to this. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to the culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognizing what he wants you to do and quickly responding to it. Amen. See, this is the, what is common among all the story. Not recognizing what eternal life is. You will not recognize what God wants you to do. Because you don't know what eternal life is, or because we don't know 
what God defines as eternal life, we are very most likely not able to recognize what he wants us to do. And when we don't recognize what he wants us to do, guess what? We are likely not going to respond to it. Amen? So I want us to pray for one another and, and just ask God to help whoever in twos, please, <laughs> whoever you pray for, that God will help him to understand what eternal life means. And that God will help him to meet the commitment of giving everyday ordinary life into his hand as an offering. So God can transform him or her from inside out. That's what needs to happen. That's what needs to happen to the priest. That's what needs to happen to the Levite. That's what needs to happen to all the thousands of people by the pool of Bethesda. God needs to transform them from inside out so they can recognize what God wants them to do and respond quickly. And that's what every member of our church needs in order for us to know what to do to live. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We bless your name. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Now, this is the last scripture, and I want us to, again, keep this in mind. In John chapter 5, verse 24. John chapter 5, verse 24. This is the last scripture. I want you to take this with you all through this week. It is urgent that you listen carefully to this. Anyone here who believes what I am saying right now, that's Jesus talking, not me, not believing what I'm saying, who believes what Jesus is saying, my, I can guarantee you my, my word <laughs> will not worth a penny. It is urgent that you listen carefully to this. Anyone here, who believes, whether you are listening by streaming or you are hearing the voice right now, who believes what I am saying right now and aligns himself with the Father, who has in fact put me in charge, has at this very moment the real lasting life. And is no longer condemned to be an outsider. This person, this very person, has taken a giant step from the word of the dead to the word of the living. I told you initially it wasn't my word. The word of the dead and the word of the living is in here on earth. And God is saying, if you believe what he is saying to you now, you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe in him, and you align yourself with God's purpose for your life, which is what we have just talked about. Your everyday ordinary life, you already have eternal life in you. Hallelujah. That's what God is saying. And you have been transformed from the word of the dead to the word of the living. I prophesy in the name of Jesus Christ for every year that he has made this day that you have been transformed from the word of the dead to the word of the living. And you have life in you and every day of your life as you go about your every ordinary daily activity, you transfer life. You release life. You create life. Yes. And every man and every woman you touch, and everywhere you go, you transfer life. You create life because there's life in you. You have been created in the likeness and the image of God to give life. He said, for this purpose, you have sent me. Now put everything humans under my care that I may give real and eternal life. 
or to everyone under my care, everyone under your auspices, everyone under your care, everyone under your influence, you have eternal life in you and you will give it unto them according to the purpose and the power that dwells within you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.